Welcome to Little Wars TV. I'm Steve, and this is part two of my series on getting started in 3D printing for historical wargamers. As I promised last time, today I'm going to talk to you about how to go about selecting the right 3D printer for you. And one thing I do want to point out is while I'll mention some names of specific 3D printers, those are not by any means the only ones that you can consider. There are plenty of others that I'm probably not going to name that are just as good, maybe even better. So with all these different 3D printers out there, how do you go about narrowing down the ones that might be right for you? Well, you do that by asking two questions. What kind of printer do I want and how much do I want to spend? Now, if you watched my first part, you may remember that the two main kind of consumer 3D printers on the market are called FDM printers, which take spools of plastic string or filament and build the model layer by layer from the bottom up. And then there are what we call resin printers, which use a number of different technologies, all of which, however, involve building the model layer by layer and drawing it out of a pool of liquid resin. Now, each of these types of printers have their own pros and cons. Probably the biggest pro for FDM printers is the cost. They're going to be cheaper. And indeed, you can get a very good FDM 3D printer for under $200. Size of the build area is another pro. Most FDM consumer printers are going to come with a build area of 200 to 250 cubic millimeters, or 8 to 10 cubic inches. And if you're willing to spend more, you can actually double or even triple that build area. Another plus for FDM printers is the relatively low cost of the raw materials you're going to be using. Those spools of filament, particularly if it's PLA plastic, which is a basic plastic, but more than good enough for anything you're going to need in wargaming, is only going to cost you $15 to $17. Also, once an FDM print is done, there's almost no post-processing necessary. You just pop the model off of the bed, maybe trim off a little excess plastic, and it's ready to paint or use in a game. That's not to say that it's all ice cream and rainbows when it comes to FDM printers, though. They do have their drawbacks as well. For some models, they're pretty noisy, uh, so you're going to have to have them in a part of the house where it's not going to bother you during everyday living. The second one is speed. They are not the fastest printers that you're going to get out there, the various 3D printing technology, and it's going to take hours to do even a, a, a medium-sized model. Finally, and probably the biggest con, is no matter how small a nozzle that you use on an FDM printer and no matter how thin you set your layers, they really, really aren't designed for super fine detail. Turning to resin printers, you really end up kind of getting a, a mirror image of what we just talked about with FDM printers. Uh, detail is the real strength of resin printers. You can get incredible fine detail with resin printers. Print speed is another advantage of resin printers. Uh, I won't say that they're super fast, but they're certainly faster than FDM printers, and you can actually print multiple models simultaneously without adding any extra time. Lastly, I'll mention that generally, though not always, resin printers tend to take up less space than their FDM counterparts. There are some serious drawbacks for resin printers, however. First of all is cost. Even at the low end of the scale, you're going to be paying two to three times as much for a cheap resin printer as you are for a cheap FDM printer. And as you go up in quality, that scales accordingly. And it's not just cost of the printer, it's also cost of the raw material. The liquefied resin that you use in a resin printer is pricier than the spools of filament that you use on an FDM. Another drawback on resin printers is they tend to have smaller build areas. We're talking maybe only about 130 cubic millimeters or 5 to 6 cubic inches, uh, which means you just can't print as big as stuff. Finally, and perhaps the biggest con of resin printers, is the resin itself. It's toxic which means you have to have safety material when you're working with the liquid resin. You need to have the printer properly vented, probably even to the outside. And then once your print is done, because there may still be liquid resin on or in it, you have to process it by washing it and letting it cure under UV light so that it doesn't break and so that you don't poison yourself. Now, taking all of those things into consideration, you might have already made up your mind about what kind of printer is right for you. If you haven't, though, if the cost doesn't matter and the resin's toxicity doesn't matter, then maybe the best thing to do is ask, what are you going to be using your printer for? Uh, as I mentioned, FDM printers aren't great at fine detail, so 
As long as you're only looking at printing miniatures of maybe 28 millimeter scale or bigger, or maybe vehicles at 15 millimeter scale or larger, or terrain pieces, FDM's going to be fine for you. If, however, you want to get down to six millimeter figures or, you know, want to make sure that there is the finest and crispest detail on the faces of your fighting men or women, then resin's really going to be your best option. One other question to ask yourself is, are you primarily a historical wargamer or primarily more of a sci-fi or fantasy wargamer? Now, this might seem like an odd question to ask when deciding what printer to get, but let me explain to you why. As you may recall from last time, unless you design your own models, you're going to be relying on STL models that you download off of the internet or, or buy from folks to then print up on your printer. Well, let me tell you, there is a ton of stuff out there for fantasy and sci-fi. Terrain, vehicles, aliens, fantasy races, men, women, whatever you're looking for, you can find it, very often for free. On the historical side, though, while there's a lot of terrain and there are some great designers out there with regard to historical vehicles, the actual soldiers, the actual fighting men and women, there really aren't a lot of those models out there. And that's important because those are the models that would need the super detail that you might be able to get from a resin printer. That's why when I was researching what printer I wanted to get, I ultimately ended up going with this FDM printer. Uh, I knew that I was going to use it primarily for terrain, I knew I was going to maybe use it for some vehicles, and didn't need the super fine detail of a resin printer. Now even after you decide whether you want an FDM printer or a resin printer, you're still going to have a wide variety at all different price points to choose from, so how do you make up your mind? Well, I can only talk to FDM printers because that's what I have. If you're interested in information on resin printers, you're going to have to go elsewhere, I'm sorry. But what I think after six months of using FDM printers is the biggest difference between prices and quality and that sort of thing isn't the actual outcome. It's not the print quality of the model itself. The difference is going to be the quality of life or the user experience. Now you may be wondering, how can I say that? I have one printer. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. I actually don't just own this one printer. I actually own two. Shh, don't tell my wife. This machine is the Prusa i3 Mark III, and it was the first 3D printer I purchased. I bought it as a kit, and it cost me $800 shipped. This machine is the Creality Ender III. I got it on sale for just under $200 shipped, only two months after I bought the Prusa. As you can see, they're both about the same size and have roughly the same build area. Having used both for multiple months now to print primarily wargaming terrain and some miniatures, I can confidently say that I have not found a significant difference in the end quality of the prints from the two printers. Now there's a reason these two printers end up looking so similar. That's because they're both based on the same original open source FDM printer design and therefore are, in truth, very, very close technological relatives. So as I sit here telling you that these machines are both similar and the quality of their output is similar as well, you may be wondering if I regret spending $600 more on the Prusa than I did the Ender. And I'll say I don't regret it in the least. Let me analogize it this way. You can have two people that are flying from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles and then get on the exact same plane, which means they'll get there just as fast as each other and they'll arrive at the same time. If one of them's in first class, however, and the other one's in basic economy, their experiences are going to be very, very different. So what kind of things am I talking about that make the Prusa first class and the Ender basic economy? Well, first there's build quality. I got both printers as kits and put them together myself, discovering that the Prusa parts just fit together better and were generally of a higher quality material. The Prusa also has things like a second Z-axis motor. I'll also note that the Prusa came with the single greatest assembly instruction manual I've ever encountered. It took me nine hours to put the printer together, but despite the complexity, I only had to loosen a single screw I had over-tightened in order to get it working once I flipped the power switch on for the first time. Second, the Prusa has automatic bed leveling, and this is huge. A level build plate is critical to getting good first layer adhesion, and first level adhesion is critical to a successful print, so making sure that you have a bed as close to level as possible is the foundation of success. Now the Prusa has a sensor that tests the bed, makes sure it's level before each print, and adjusts to account for any imperfections. 
The Ender, on the other hand, doesn't, and requires the user to manually level its bed using four knobs, two in the front, two in the back. This isn't a hard task, but it can get a little tricky to get the hang of it. Moreover, unless you replace the bed springs on the Ender with better ones, you'll have to re-level after every few prints. Third is overall reliability. Look, I've had failed prints on both of these machines, and each time I try and figure out exactly why it is my print failed. Now, every time I've had something fail with the Prusa, I've ultimately discovered it was my fault. I used a bad setting or didn't make sure that it was set up and exactly correct. On the Ender, while some of them have been my fault, some of them I just couldn't figure out what it was until finally I learned that one of the motors that controls one of the axis would just stop working for two or three layers and then try and start up again. I still don't know why that is. Another difference is noise. The Prusa is an incredibly quiet machine. If I'm not in the room, I can't hear it. And even sometimes when I'm in the room, I can't hear it. Uh, the Ender, on the other hand, I can go out of the room, down the hall, down some stairs, across another hall, and sit down in my office and still hear it upstairs. Next, there's the print bed itself. Prusa uses coated spring steel that can be removed and bent to facilitate removal of your completed prints. Then you can pop the sheet back onto the bed where magnets secure it in place. On the Ender, your print bed is a textured sheet of what looks like aluminum, and it doesn't really bend much. Sometimes it requires a spatula to scrape off your print. It's also only secured by these binder clips, not magnets. Now, two other things I haven't had direct experience with, but I think are worth noting is, by reputation, Prusa's support is very, very responsive, whereas Creality's is a little bit more spotty. In both cases, though, they both have active communities that'll help you try and work out any problems you might be having. The other one is a little bit more disconcerting, and it was with the Ender when I first got it. I jumped online to see what advice people had, and one of the biggest pieces of advice I saw people say to do before you even made your first print was update the firmware so that it didn't start a fire. Hmm. Now, there are certainly more differences than the ones that I've listed between these two printers, but these are the ones that have jumped out at me over the months that I've used them, and it's also the reason why I kind of disagree with all those people online who talk about the Ender 3 as being the best 3D printer for new FDM users. Um, I kind of disagree. I think that the Prusa is a, is a better FDM printer for beginning 3D printers. Uh, and it's not that the Ender isn't good, it, it's actually a very, very good machine, but the learning curve is steeper because so much is automated and so much is easier with the Prusa. For a beginner, it's just a better place to start. Now, that may not be worth the $600 price difference that I mentioned earlier. Only you can decide that. For me, it was. Uh, I, and again, I don't regret getting the Prusa at all. I'm very happy with both printers, and I'm glad that I have them both. To be fair, I should also mention that there are upgrades that you can get for the Ender so that it has features like automatic bed leveling. However, that will require some technical know-how, and it's going to require some additional cost. That's probably enough for this episode, uh, but before I let you go, let me make one more point. If you decide to buy yourself a 3D printer, I really, really advise you to buy a kit, not a pre-made printer. There's two reasons for this. The first one is it's going to be cheaper, and it's always good to save money. It's more filament that you can buy. Uh, the second one, though, is by building the printer from a kit, and I did that with both of these, you learn how the printer works. You learn all the little parts. They're not hard to build at all, but you learn how they work. And thus, if a problem crops up, it's going to be a lot easier for you to figure out how to solve it yourself or when you're getting advice from other people online or through customer service to ask you to do something like tighten a screw here, loosen a screw there. You're actually going to know where that screw is, what it looks like. And so learn about your machine when you build it. That's my advice to you. Thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, comments, if you disagree with anything that I said here, go ahead and post them down below, or you can head over to the Little Wars TV Facebook page and post them there. Uh, also, if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit subscribe. That way you'll find out when the next episode in this 3D printing series is posted. And you won't want to miss that, because I'm going to go over some of the great places that you can get 3D printable files specifically for historical wargamers. I'll see you then.